So what were we doing last time? So we were uh, talking about the risk representation theorem. So let's recall what that is. So this is uh, the theorem. No, uh, I think, yeah, it's written here. So suppose X is a locally compact Hausdorff space. So as I said, you can uh, think of the prime example is you can think of as Rn, okay? So Euclidean space or any reasonable subset of it uh, is a locally compact Hausdorff space. And uh, so I, I gave two main examples. You can think of Rn as uh, Q. I mean, these examples are sufficient to, I mean, it's already powerful for those examples, but it is much more general than that. So you have a locally compact Hausdorff space and then L is a positive linear functional on the space of compactly supported continuous functions on X. So these are functions from X to R, which are compactly supported. That means they vanish outside a compact set and uh, they are continuous. So then the claim is that this L is represented by a unique regular Boyle probability, uh, Boyle measure, not probability, regular Boyle measure. Well, what does that mean? L of F is actually integral of FD mu. With, uh, so integral of F with respect to mu. And this mu is a measure on the Boyle sigma algebra of X. And the, the uniqueness is also claimed here. Okay. So this is the statement of risk representation theorem. The other way is already there. And I have emphasized that many times. If you start with the measure mu and consider integral FD mu, as the that's a functional for every f in cc of x we can define this why can we do this because if i assume mu is if i assume mu is a regular boyle measure uh, then i oh okay so did i not say mu of yeah so if it is if mu is read on then uh, mu of k is finite for all compact k that is going to be the case in general also i didn't write here along with regularity you can say mu of k is compact for every k that is the radon property so therefore for any compactly supported continuous function it is easy to see that the integral fd mu exists it is a finite number and so this gives you a linear functional on uh, cc of x and it is clearly seen to be positive also because the non-negative function will have non-negative integral so, the, but the converse part, this is the uh, amazing thing that from L we can get mu, meaning from every L corresponds to mu. As I explained last time, this also has implications. It kind of uh, gives a motivation to, I mean, justifies our choice of defining measures using countable additivity. That was one point I said, okay? So now I wanted to go to the proof of that, uh, proof of this representation theorem but I'm sticking to a somewhat restricted setting, compact metric space, okay? I'm taking X to be a compact metric space. Now, compactness is, by the way, not a big restriction. Compactness is not a big restriction because, oh, sorry, uh, metric space is not such a, I mean, uh, it depends on what you mean. Um, of course, uh, in, my, in a mathematics, you would like to write theorems with the absolutely minimal conditions because you want to know what conditions are really essential to get the conclusion. Okay, so for example, so metric space is good enough in the sense that all examples you will construct, you will consider are usually metric spaces. So that way you don't lose out on examples if you stick to metric spaces and the ones that are not metric spaces are really pathological or, or they occur very unusually. So the compactness of course is a bit restrictive. For example, even the real line and iron is excluded. You can only stick to bounded subsets of iron. So that is restrictive, but nevertheless, what I want to do is give a proof in this setting. And I think the proof can be extended also to the locally compact case, uh, but uh, I don't want to do it here. I'll just skip that. At some point I may write it into the notes, but what I will do is give a proof and that will give you an essential idea of, the, of how this is done, okay? So this was my goal. And uh, so now I will go over the proof, but before that, uh, were there any questions from last time regarding anything? Uh, so, so uh, is the definitions and uh, statements and everything clear? So what we will do now is go through the proof of this. I had already indicated some part of it, but uh, we'll continue from there. So what we have is X is a compact metric space with a metric D. So example zero, one to the N, you can think of that example. And L is a positive linear functional on C of X. Now, since X is itself compact, there is no need to say compactly supported. 
okay all uh, continuous functions are compactly supported they all are supported within x okay so that is that way c c of x is not necessary we can just write c of x so l is a positive linear functional on c of x from this we have to produce a measure right so that is the goal we have to produce a measure and the one way we know how to produce measures is to define an outer measure and then uh, restrict it to the class of measurable subsets so that's what we do here so the outer measure is going to be defined like this we define mu star of a as the infimum of sum of l of fi where fi are continuous functions on x such that summation fi beats indicator of it okay so this is how you define so last time i motivated why i take this countable sum it is very analogous to the way we defined uh, outer measure using measures on intervals okay finite uh, sums will not do you have to allow countable sums so that was the point so we define mu star of a like this for every subset a of x we define like this it is a well defined thing because you can always take f1 to be 1 one on the whole of x that's a continuous function and if all f2 f3 etc zero so you can see that in fact this is well defined so f1 is 1 f2 equals zero dot 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 will show it's a valid cover a valid collection of functions so it is kind of clear that mu star of a is between zero and l of 1 because this example shows you that uh, then the sum will be l of 1 the constant function 1 so since we have an infimum here that is an upper bound so l of 1 is an upper bound for mu star of a and mu star of a is always non negative because this is a non empty subset and uh, infimum is of non negative numbers infimum will be non negative so for mu star is an outer measure so first part is that it is non negative the second uh, this is not needed for definition of outer measure i have just written this that mu star of a is bounded okay that's not needed mu star in general outer measure can also take the value infinity there is no problem but in compact situation that won't happen second is monotonicity if a is a subset of b then mu star is less than equal to mu star b also obvious because if a is subset of b any summation f5 if it is if it beats indicator b then it also beats indicator a so you are taking infimum over a larger class of uh, f1 f2 dot 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 that's why mu star of a will be smaller so infimum of a larger set is smaller that's what happens here so monotonicity is also clear the thing to check was countable subadditivity and i did that last time so that's also not difficult because if a n are subsets and a is the union we have to show mu star of a is less than equal to sum of mu star of a n and the way we do it is okay for each n a n there is a collection of functions fn1 fn2 dot 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 such that their sum may beats indicator an but sum of l of fnj is at most mu star of an plus epsilon over 2 to the n because this mu star an is the infimum of such quantities but uh, so we can find something that almost achieves the infimum so it is this L, summation l of fnj is at most mu star an plus epsilon over 2 to the n now you take all these fnjs together then their sum will be indicator of a1 union a2 union etc which is indicator a. i mean at least indicator a. so summation f and j beats indicator a and summation l of f and j over both n and j will be less than mu star of a n uh, plus epsilon because you just sum these things the epsilon over 2 to the n sum to epsilon so what you get is that mu star of a which is the infimum of such quantities over all functions which satisfy this so f and j are continuous functions so mu star of a is at most mu star of an plus i mean sum of mu star of an plus epsilon which is what we wanted to show okay so this is this shows that mu star is a outer measure okay once you have an outer measure you get a sigma algebra of measurable subsets defined by the cartesian cut condition and restricted to that sigma algebra mu star becomes a measure this is an abstract result we have seen but in abstract uh, that so sigma algebra may also be extremely small but there was a condition of that ensures that this sigma algebra is sufficiently big okay, so i will go there now so but any questions so so far it was recap are there any questions is it clear why we are here and what we are doing
Okay. So in that case, let me proceed. So the next property I want to claim is, no. I want to claim now that is a metric outer measure. That means if I take two disjoint sets, then I get mu star A plus mu star B. So it's not merely subadditive but additive. If A, B are subsets of X such that distance of A, B is strictly positive. Okay, so what is distance of AB? It is the infimum of distance of points one in A and the other in B. So if the distance is zero, there are points in A and points in B which come arbitrarily close. So distance is not uh, zero means that you, there is a uniform lower bound. So there is some delta positive such that any point in X is uh, at distance, uh, any point in X and any point in Y are at distance more than delta. That's what it says. Okay, but what we are saying is it's a metric outer measure means at least when two sets are not nearly disjoint but well separated, that is they are separated by positive distance, then the additivity holds. Mu star of A union B is mu star A plus mu star B. Okay, so this is what I want to show. Okay, let's prove this. Why is this so? Okay, so let A and B be such sets. So, Suppose distance is bigger than two delta. Okay, so I just call that number a positive number. Let's say it be it is bigger than two delta. This is the picture. Okay, this will be very impossible to draw with. So let me just draw a more convenient way. So A and B are uh, separated from each other. Okay, the relationship could be quite complicated, but it's just picture. I mean, just a depiction. So the distance, maybe in this case here, this is the closest distance that we are assuming is at least two delta. So how do we uh, show that mu star of A union B is at least mu star A plus mu star B? One way is always obvious, by the way. So the thing is, the this less than equal to is always obvious, right? So it is greater than or equal to that I need to show. So by subadditivity, this is true. So what about the other way? I want to show that this is true. Well, the way, how do I do that? So if you remember how this worked out in Lebesgue measure case, so if you have a covering of A union B by rectangles, you can always subdivide your rectangles so that they are very small, very, very tiny. So let's say the side lengths of the rectangle are smaller than delta or so. Then you take those rectangles which intersect A and those rectangles which intersect B, that becomes a disjoint collection. That's how we were able to separate and uh, get something. So here it, the idea is similar. So if I, what does it mean? Okay, so I want, I take mu star of A union B is the infimum of L of F, I mean, or summation L F Y, where F Y's are continuous functions which cover A union B. Okay, so suppose we have that, then we have to separate them. Okay, we have to separate, suppose, Uh, 
So position F I is greater than equal to A and B, and sum of L of F I is less than equal to mu star of A union B plus epsilon. Suppose, suppose we have that. This epsilon is some number, and then for any epsilon, I can find some functions F I such that this happens. Now, how do I separate these functions? Some of these functions. may uh, touch a and b their support may touch a and b so what we will do is we have to separate these fi's into two functions so the way we do it is so let let's call it phi a of x it is phi a delta of x b i will write down the formula and then explain okay so it is 1 minus distance of x to a over delta min 1 okay what what does it look like let's let's be clear a is like this so if x is in a so let's look at this function delta is a positive number what is this function looking like when x is in a what is the distance of x to a it is zero here right so zero over delta is zero minimum one is again this is minimum zero over delta zero min one is zero so this minus this is 1 minus 0 so this will be the function will be 1 here the function value is 1 here now let us take outside suppose x is a point at distance more than delta so this is here is a point x whose distance to a is bigger than delta then what is uh, bigger than equal to delta then what is phi a delta of x now this becomes dx a over delta is greater than 1 right greater than equal to 1 minimum one will be 1 and 1 minus 1 will be 0 so the function value will be 0 okay the function value is 0 so this is a function which is 1 on a zero outside of a delta neighborhood of a and what will happen here here it will be between between zero and 1 okay so it's always a non negative number because 1 minus this minimum is less than 1 less than equal to 1 1 minus that will be non negative so this is a function sort of which is i mean if what does it look like in the real line what are we doing it is like in the real line it is sometimes this construction is used suppose i have an interval i want to approximate the interval by a continuous function so the in, in, interval is like its indicator which is one everywhere but we will usually take if we need a continuous function we take something that vanishes a bit outside you can take it linearly down or smoothly down there are many ways so let's say this is a and b and this is b plus delta here and this is a minus delta here so then this vanishes in a uh, so this this is a type of function we are thinking of phi delta is exactly like that it is one on the set we want zero a little bit outside the set in this case delta neighborhood outside delta neighborhood of a and everywhere it is between zero and one so that's what this phi delta is so similarly phi b delta is also similar phi b delta of x is 1 minus distance of x to b over delta min 1 okay so if you look at this picture uh, because a and b are at distance at least two delta so since a and b are at least distance two delta so this delta will only reach like this Sorry. Yeah. So the delta neighborhood of A and the delta neighborhood of B are disjoint, right? So phi A, uh, so outside it, so these two have disjoint supports. Okay. So note that both of them can't be non-zero at the same time because 
after distance delta from a this function is zero after distance delta from b this is zero and those two delta neighborhoods are disjoint therefore this is fine so now how is that helpful i will use this to break a function into two pieces so i had this function fi such that summation fi almost achieves the infimum which defines mu star of a union b mu star of a union b is the infimum of this quantity over all fi's such that summation fi is this beats integrator a union b that's all it is right uh, fi is a continuous function so now how do i break it now define g i to be f i times phi a and h i to be f i times phi b. Okay, so what is the point of this? G i is f i times phi a. So for example, on a itself, it will remain f i. So let's take g1. G1 is f1 times phi a, but here it is 1. So it will be like f1. And outside of a delta, the delta neighborhood of a, it will be 0. But in between, it is inflated in different ways. Okay. So then, so def define uh, this. Sir, so one query. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sir, here A is a subset of X, right? Yes. A and B uh, are both subsets of X. Yes. So D of uh, X comma A uh, will be always zero, right? Why? Uh, distance between uh, like X. A is inside X. Here X. Is a point. No, no, no. X is a point here. Oh. Okay, this okay, x, yeah, is, sorry, this sorry, x yeah. is a point. I mean, okay, so there is a capital X, which is the whole space, but this distance is a point. Okay. So, dis okay. so distance yeah. of, uh, well, where did I def not define? Distance of AB is the infimum of the pairwise distances between A and B. Did I not write here somewhere? Yeah, so distance. So this is the meaning of distance. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, I just misunderstood. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, the small x, okay, capital X is not featuring here. I will write capital X really big, okay? So, this is small x. I, maybe a different uh, symbol would have been better, but I didn't uh, think of it. Uh, so, this is small x. Is okay? Now, the, is it clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. Okay. So, we take gi and multiply. So, you can see what happens in the real line. I mean, okay, or even the general case should be clear. So let me just write the properties, some properties. So fi, so gi and fi, okay, gi is greater than or equal to indicator a. Sorry, summation gi. So let's first write. Yeah, so I, I want to say that First, I want to say that GI and FI are disjoint supports. In fact, uh, so part of that GI is equal to so FI in a. Yes. Do you mean GI and HI by any chance? Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, right, 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 sorry, HI. GI and HI have disjoint supports. Maybe I write all the things. If things are not obvious, I will explain, okay? So maybe writing them in words, I think it is kind of clear. So they are, GI will be supported in this dotted region and HI will be supported in this because it's multiplied by phi A. And also inside A, GI is same as FI. And inside B, GI is same as uh, this. So, HI is FI in B. Hence, if you look at summation GI, that is greater than or equal to 1. Uh, summation FI, okay, I ended up erasing some stuff here. What the hell was this? Sorry. So, this is phi sub a comma delta, this, this is phi sub b comma delta. Okay. So if I take summation gi, that is same as summation fi in a, but summation fi beats indicator of a union b. Therefore, summation gi is greater than or equal to indicator of a. So also, uh, summation hi is greater than or equal to indicator of b. 
Okay, so this is also clear. By the way, GI and HI are compactly uh, 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 GI, HI are continuous functions. This is capital X because GI is the product of two, uh, GI is the product of two continuous functions, HI is the product of two continuous functions. Distance is always a continuous function on a metric space. So these are uh, continuous functions, okay? And then, uh, so what do I get from here? So this means that, hence, so the point is, mu star of A is less than equal to summation L of GI, right? Because some GIs are continuous functions whose sum beats indicator A. So mu star of A is the infimum of this over all such GIs. So here is a specific choice of GI. So this will beat that. Similarly, mu star of B is beaten by summation L of HI. Now, what we know is that this is same as So what I'm doing is I'm adding term by term, L of GI plus L of HA is L of GI plus HA. That is by, um, that is by uh, just uh, linearity, okay? So this we have. Now the point is, uh, uh, this is GI plus HA is less than equal to FI. This is also another point which I did not write. GI plus HA is at most FI because phi a plus phi b is at most one. Phi a is one here. Phi a plus phi b is one here and one here, but uh, elsewhere it is less than one. So this is less than equal to L of four o'clock. Okay, so this was by linearity of L. And this is by positivity of L. And the fact that GI plus HI is less than or equal to FI. Okay. And what is summation L of FI? They were chosen so that summation L of FI is at most mu star of A union B plus epsilon. So we have shown that mu star A plus mu star B is at most mu star of A union B plus epsilon true for all epsilon, hence epsilon positive, hence mu star of A union B is less than equal to mu star of A plus mu star of B. So that completes the proof. Because anyway, the other way is clear from subadditivity. So we just had to show this and uh, so I have shown that mu star is a metric outer measure. Any questions so far? Okay. If not, we are kind of done almost. We are now almost, we can now put together all the conclusions. So proof of. Sir, the last inequality should say greater than or equal to. Ah, you're right, you're right. This is greater than equal to, sorry. What I got is mu star, ah, okay. This is true for all epsilon, so epsilon equal to zero works. Mu star of A plus mu star of B. Proof of rest here. So when X is a compact metric space. Okay, so what are the steps? Mu star is a out is an outer measure. Hence mu, which is mu star restricted to 
L, I call it L, is a measure on the sigma algebra L is all A contained in X, A satisfies cut condition. Theoretically cut condition. So you so restricted to that collection, you get a measure. But the metric property tells you that is a metric outer measure implies that the cell contains. So let me call this mu tilde. OK, so there. So mu L contains the Boyle sigma algebra of X. Hence, the conclusion that mu is, I take mu to be mu star restricted to the Boyle sigma algebra of X is a Boyle machine. Okay, it's a Boyle measure. Also, so what can we say about this Boyle measure? Mu of the whole space is mu star of X, which is the same as L of one. Okay, mu star of X is you have to, to get mu star of X, you have to take all functions such that with sum. So anyway, it is okay. Let me just write less than equal to L of one. I don't want to bother justifying this. So it's always because that we saw. That's one way of doing it. So anyway, this is a finite Boyle measure. It's a finite measure. Now, what else do we know about it? I want to say that L represent L is represented by this mu, right? Uh, why is that? So we have to show that. Uh, yeah, so why does L, why is L represented by mu? If I take some uh, um, yeah, what is it? I want to show. Sorry. So this gives you an outer measure. It has the metric property. So this gives you a measure. Now we have to say L of F is integral F D mu for all uh, A in uh, the Boyle sigma algebra. Now why is that too? Uh, right. Oops. Um, right. So if you take, let me see. Let A be closed. Okay. So take a closed set now. So, and then let phi n of x be that thing that I had taken before. Phi n of x or phi, uh, you remember this phi a comma. Okay, so I had written phi a comma. Let's take one over n of x, which is you remember one minus distance of x to a divided by one by n minimum one. Okay, what happens to this function as n goes to infinity? So I say this decreases to the indicator A as n goes to infinity. You know, I mean, so why is that? So remember, if A is like this, phi A comma 1 by n is 0 outside a 1 by n neighborhood of A. So if this is 1 by n neighborhood, it is 0 here. So if you take any point outside of A, 
ultimately it is at some positive distance from a that is because a is closed okay if a is not closed you can take something right on the boundary but i am taking a closed so any point not in a is at a positive distance from a therefore phi a 1 by n of x will be z over such x after some point on the other hand if x is inside a all these are equal to 1 okay so this decreases these functions it is easy to see they decrease to indicator a as n goes to infinity and uh, so what so what because of that by monotone convergence theorem okay so actually i'm confusing myself to it something so yeah so this this will in decrease to ha uh, this will decrease to mu of a that is true but uh, this is actually uh, okay and this is less than or equal to this is less than or equal to mu of the set x such that distance of x to a is less than 1 by a right because outside that anyway this is zero so it is and inside that it is between zero and 1 okay so the function is one here zero here here it is between zero and 1 so when i integrate this what well, the integral is sandwiched on two sides so on one side by the integral of 1 on with respect to mu that is mu of a so this is greater than equal to mu of a on the other hand it is bounded by the integral of 1 on the slightly larger set namely this one so this is an open set right so this is let us call it gn so this is an open set containing a why is it an open set because this is a continuous function we are taking the inverse image of an open set under a continuous function so what we see is that thus there exists so what this shows is for a closed mu of gn decreases to mu of a okay uh yeah what uh, then what do i want to say uh, i want to say mu is mu has the regularity property that's what i wanted to say does this show the regularity property what if uh, a is not closed i want to show this for if a is not closed uh, yeah if a is not closed I am slightly getting confused now. Yeah, what I actually find, find first thing I want to do is actually show that L represents. Uh, I mean, L is represented by mu. The other things are details which I can show. For a closed, I have shown that. So implies. So for a closed, mu of a is the infimum of uh, mu of g where g is open. Uh, what if a is not? closed it is not closed then what happens yeah i'm getting confused okay so the regularity property okay i have to figure this out so let me see if i have uh, i was writing this into my notes in the morning as i said this is a proof for i just am working i worked out i mean it must be somewhere in some book i was trying to do this way but let me see if i yeah so from this we get a uh, right why does uh, mu represent uh, l that is the first question i want to actually answer regularity will follow maybe but uh, yeah, yeah okay 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 so yeah i yeah so if a is not closed i was getting confused okay so if a is not closed yeah i was smarter in the morning than i am now uh, so this i don't need a to be closed okay so 
let a be a subset of x how do i manage uh, yeah, yeah. So I want to say that, uh, yeah, what do I want to say? Uh, right, so, so let A be, uh, so I want to show outer regularity, okay? So let A be in X, find, FI, uh, Ah, okay, okay. Actually, there is a small mistake there. Sorry. Ah, I now realize that I'm okay. Let me let me skip the regularity part. Okay, for uh, I'll I may come to that. Let me first uh, try to show that L is represented by mu. That is the most important part. Why is that true? Okay, I want to say that L of f is integral of f with respect to d mu. Okay, so why is that? Uh, Yeah, so why is uh, that? If it is a continuous function, then L of F is uh, Does anybody see why uh, this should be so? Yeah, we have defined mu, mu star like this and uh, Yeah. Oh, that makes an argument. Mm. Okay, so I actually, I mean, this, this is uh, certainly true, but I did not uh, write down the argument. I realized that the argument I wrote down is 40. I made a mistake there. Uh, yeah, does anyone see a way? to show this for example i mean so then we can so this is there we have to now show that l of f is actually the integral of f with respect to mu Yeah, no, I don't see. Actually, sorry, I'm a bit stuck. I, I should have. Uh, I should have been more cautious about my proof. I had uh, something, but I, I mean, that is uh, wrong. I mean, I, I got to have written something wrong for myself. I did not uh, go over it. Okay, so let me just put a, uh, put a mark here instead of wasting time. Let me just say that. Need to show two things. That L of F is actually is mu is uh, regular. So actually one thing about regular is in compact when x is itself compact you only need to show outer regularity okay because then by taking complements you will get inner regularity so you can show one of them that is enough. So mu is regular and lastly uniqueness. Uniqueness is actually easy 
uniqueness is actually easy but uh, the the uh, this is what uh, these two things i mean so okay so let me say omit for now maybe the time next class if i manage to fix it so if you if i don't fix it then basically yes so better i suggest that you just read the proof from one of the books uh, so this uh, I, I don't see why this shouldn't work, but uh, it is possible, of course, till we have the complete uh, proof that there is some mistake in uh, thinking. But uh, OK, sorry about that, uh, but I will leave it at this. Uh, any questions? I mean, in a general sense, of course, these parts I haven't shown. But if anyone has suggestion, I will be even more interested. Yeah, so the general idea is sort of clear what you have to do. You have to sandwich the values of mu of a set between L of f with supported inside, outside, and then one has to do some limiting arguments. Monotone convergence on this side. What on this side is the slight question that I am confused about. Okay, so anyway, let's uh, do it. Uh, let me leave it for now. Okay, all right. So that uh, that would be the end of this representation theorem proof. I mean, so yeah, this is only in the compact metric space, but that conveys the idea well enough. Uh, if uh, well, if the proof was complete, it would have. Okay, so what I want to say next, uh, I move to a slightly different topic. That's why if there are questions, now is a good time to ask. So I wanted to uh, go back to that topic of duality that I was talking about last time and uh, say what uh, uh, say something about it. Uh, so how it extends in the infinite dimensional setting. OK, so last time we saw. Uh, maybe I left a computation to you, but uh, so we know if X is. OK, well, let's leave out F, uh, X for a moment. If V is a finite dimensional vector space over R, then V, oh, if V is a vector space, uh, yeah, a finite dimensional vector space over R, V star is the set of L from V to R, L is linear. And you study that V star is a, when V is, so this is then V is actually, is, so if V is isomorphic to iron, it's, it's isomorphic to some iron, then V star will also be isomorphic to iron. Okay, so where a Y in iron acts as LY of X equal to summation x i y i. So we saw this last time when on iron, we understand the linear functionals. So the, this is something that you will do in functional analysis uh, next uh, semester, uh, so those of you who take it. So in infinite, when you go to infinite dimensional vector spaces, so then it is, uh, so as I said, so you study linear algebra, but functional analysis. Functional analysis is, uh, Basically, linear algebra in infinite dimensions, but it's no longer algebra because what happens is you must introduce a topology. So if V is a Banach space, well, uh, so okay, so Actually, I don't need all the hypothesis of Banach space. You may remember that Banach space is that it is a it is a vector space over R with a norm in which it is complete. Okay. 
Okay, so there's a norm in which the vector space is complete. Okay, so that's what a Banach space is. Now, in such a situation, we star the dual. What is it? It is defined as all L from V to R such that its L is linear and continuous. Okay, so when you go to infinite dimensional vector spaces, first of all, it doesn't make much, you don't get much if you don't put a topology on V. Now, the minimal thing you can do is you can take a, a vector space with a topology that is called a topological vector space. I don't want to go into the definition. It's, uh, it's more or less, uh, you can imagine what it should be, but I don't want to get there. And let me just stick to the Banach space setting, which is good enough for most purposes. So let's say V is a Banach space. In that case, we get a natural topology on V, right? Because we actually get a metric from the norm. So the completeness I'm not using at the moment. So V is a normed vector space over V R. Then there's a metric induced on V. So it becomes, there's a topology. From the metric, you have open sets, closed sets, convergence, everything you have. And then the dual space is defined. This is the definition of the dual space. It's not any old linear functional, okay? It's not any old linear functional, but linear functionals that also respect the topology, namely they are continuous in the norm. So this means that if uh, Xn converges to X in V, then L of Xn converges to L of X, right? That's what continuity means. But everything being linear, you see that this is somehow easy. I mean, so this instead of Xn, you take Yn going to zero. Yn is Xn minus X, let's say. So Xn minus X goes to zero in V, then L of Yn, which is L of Xn minus X, goes to zero. So in other words, since it's linear, continuity needs to be checked only at zero. So, so a linear functional, if it is continuous at one point, it will be continuous everywhere. So it's enough to con check continuity at the origin of the vector space. Okay. So, but this is what is called the dual space of V. So this you will study when you do functional analysis class, you will study these things in quite some detail. And uh, it is a very important uh, space associated to a Banach space. In fact, it is itself, a, uh, so when V is a Banach space, you, you get a norm also on this. When V is, when V has a norm on V star, so this is first of all a vector space. This is a vector space that is easy because if I have two linear functionals, the sum is also a linear functional. If uh, and continuity also, sum of two continuous functions is continuous. So sum of two continuous linear functionals is continuous linear. And uh, so it's a vector space over R. Scalar multiple two L is also a continuous linear functional. And not only that, it is in fact, uh, uh, it has a norm. Norm star where L, the norm star of L is defined as supremum of Lx over all x in V with norm x less than or equal to 1. Okay, it is the supremum of L on the unit ball, absolute value of L on the unit ball of V. Take the unit ball of V and take the supremum. This is just like we saw in the finite dimensional setting. So you get, so this V star, so V and has a norm and it is actually complete in that norm. So this is a Banach space actually. So, is a Banach space, okay? So for every Banach space, there's a dual, which is another Banach space. 
now the thing is it stands out so what are what are the things that people study in functional analysis as the name suggests the space banach spaces will be usually spaces of functions they could be other things they could be sometimes spaces of measures and spaces of some more complicated objects but usually it is spaces of functions now a banach space uh, so the dual space is another space and uh, one of the uh, one small uh, aspect or uh, one aspect of uh, the study in functional analysis is to identify the dual space of a uh, if uh, if you have an interesting banach space it is definitely worth uh, why to find its dual space as explicitly as you can okay it will turn out to be i cannot tell you why you have to study the functional analysis course to see it the dual space is a very important tool to study the original banach space and vice versa so so what is the dual space of a of natural spaces so is an important problem it's always an important problem to find the dual space of a banach space so what uh, i want to tell you is another bunch of uh, theorem that's also called this representation theorem or let's just call it this theorem uh, so what he showed was he found actual dual spaces for this natural class of banach spaces namely the lp spaces is there any question about the definitions here i mean i, I have just uh, given a very cut and dry definition uh, but is it at least logically clear what v and v star are unlike in finite dimensional thing here you have to have a norm i mean we are taking v to be a banach space then v star will be only continuous i mean by definition only continuous linear functionals then you can define a norm on it and it will be in fact be a banach space actually all these are elementary facts not difficult but for now you just take it on faith right we don't care okay i don't want to prove it now you can uh, do it later in functional analysis class but is there, is there any question about the definitions so the problem is that to find if you have a natural banach space what is its dual and we do have natural banach spaces so which is that if so we take uh, be a measure space now i'm forgetting whether i need any condition such as sigma finiteness okay so let me just put it in bracket with a question it is easily verified by checking a book whether i need sigma finiteness or not but let's that's not the anyway most of our measures will be sigma finite so then the dual of This space. This is a Banach space. Is L Q of X F mu, where one by P plus one by Q is one. Okay. For P, any let P be anything between one and uh, strictly smaller than infinity. Let me write here. Okay. It's very important. so p is not infinity p can be 1 but not infinity so q can be then if p is 1 q is infinity so q can be infinity but q cannot be 1 because if q is 1 p has to be infinity p equals infinity is not allowed but p equal to 1 and q equal to infinity is allowed so you take that dual uh, the conjugate exponent q which is defined like this then the dual of lp is lq by this i mean so how how i mean what do what does it mean dual of this is this well g in lq of mu 
acts on LP of mu by let's give a name. I don't want to use L. I was using L for linear functional, but L is already overused here in LP spaces. Uh, so maybe I don't even give any name. So what does it map F to? It just maps it to F G D mu. Okay, so that is what it says. Okay, it uh, maps to uh, this by F G D mu. Okay, so this is the so every G in L Q. So what? Uh, so let me just remark what is easy. So this is, is the statement of Ries theorem. It is identifying the dual of this. By this we mean that even with the norms, okay, the norm on LP is the usual norm, LP norm. The dual has a norm defined like this. That will be actually the LQ norm, okay. So that's what is. So let me explain that point. But is there any question about the statement of the theorem? Is it uh, clear, sort of? So I may explain a couple of things here. So, so if G is in LQ and F is in LP. We know by Holder's inequality we know that F G is in L1. And in fact, uh, norm FG L1 is less than equal to norm FP, norm GQ with equality if and only if something like this, right? Mod F to the P equals mod G to the Q almost surely and FG is uh, either has a constant sign. I think it can be completely positive or completely negative. That's okay. Is constant sign. Almost sure. So you may remember the equality case, but anyway, you remember this. So because of that, if you look at this thing, so therefore, so may, now maybe I do give it a name. So hence, if TF is the mapping from LP of mu to R defined as TF of, uh, sorry, TG. So TG is defined as TG acts on F uh, by integral FG d mu. So this is how it acts. Then several points about it. One, it is well defined. Because FG is integrable. Right, because FG is integrable, right? Because uh, that's what holders inequality say. So this integral makes sense. Not only that, TG of F, it's a real number, is bounded by, TG of F is actually integral FG absolute value. It is bounded by the L1 norm of FG. Right, I mean, if you remember that uh, absolute value of integral is less than integral of the absolute value. So this is less than equal to integral of the absolute value, which is L1 norm of FG, which is less than equal to norm G Q times norm F P holders. What this shows is, If Fn goes to zero in LP, if Fn is a sequence that goes to zero in LP, then 
TGFN goes to zero in R because this norm will go to zero, right? So norm TGFN will be bounded by norm GQ times norm FNP and that will go to second part will go to zero. Therefore, that will go to zero. Hence, TG is actually continuous. is a continuous linear function. So in short, TG does belong to LP dual. Okay. So TG, uh, let me write it. So what this implies is that TG belongs to LP of mu dual because it's a continuous linear functional on LP. And in fact, what will be the uh, dual norm of TG? Right? The dual norm of TG is the supremum of over F in LP of mu of norm fp less than equal to 1 of this tg of f. Okay, so that's what we have to take. And what you see is that you can always find f, f which will be like this. So this, so uh, what, so I will, I can make the holder inequality become equality here. Okay, so this is in fact, what I want to claim is this is in fact equal to lq norm of g. So the dual norm of the linear functional given by G is in fact the LQ norm of G. Why is this? So for this you look at the, consider the equality case in holder. Okay. Consider the equality case in holders. Actually, I now realize uh, some of you may have found it confusing. Here the equality holds when, actually, what did I write the other day? When does equality hold? I wrote something incorrect here. Equality. If and only if this. See, all none of this depends on f or g. It depends only on absolute f and absolute g, right? Because here it's the integral of absolute f g. Here it's the integral of absolute f to the power p in integral of so f and g shouldn't matter. Only absolute f and absolute g should matter. So there can't be this second condition that I I just wrote it by some thinking wrongly. That condition comes here. Okay. So suppose how do I at if I want to attain equality here, I have to have equality here as well as here. Okay, so this is one point where I need equality. And I also need equality here. For this equality, I should want integral of absolute, absolute value of integral equal to integral of absolute value. That happens when the integrand is positive or full, always positive or always negative. That's why, uh, so this, equality for this to happen, not only this, but also a condition that fg positive should works. So can take, so in other words, can take f such that fg is firstly non-negative and mod f to the p equal to mod g to the q almost surely with respect to me. You have to find an F such that this happens and that is easy, right? This tells you the mod F and that tells you the sign of the F at every point. So you can find the equality case. So this is actually the dual norm. So what we, what, so one way, this is telling you one way. This is telling you that all of LQ, every LQ function gives you a dual uh, element of the dual, namely a linear functional, continuous linear functional on LP. And its uh, dual norm will be, in fact, the LQ norm. 
But what this theorem is telling is that's all. There are no other linear func continuous linear functionals. These are all there is, nothing more. Okay, that's what this theorem is telling. So what this theorem is saying is that that these are all the continuous. linear functionals on LP. Okay, so that is not clear. That is not clear. And uh, that, uh, that is what is uh, the non-trivial part of uh, Reza's representation here. I mean, this is this theorem. Okay, any questions? Uh, so I will not be proving this here. Uh, it requires one more thing, that is the next topic that I will go into, but uh, I will not do this, uh, probably I will not come back and prove this. There is not enough time and uh, this is, yeah, okay, so that's what it is. So there are other, what other Banach space you have? Anytime you have a Banach space, it is actually useful to uh, uh, think of uh, these things. So let me tell you another theorem which is also related to the other risk theorem that I did. But if there are any questions, please ask. If, um, okay, so as I said, anytime you have a Banach space, it is worthwhile asking what is the dual space, okay? It's an important question. So here, ah, what happens in uh, the one case I forgot to mention, when L infinity, uh, for L infinity, this is not true, actually. All this is correct, actually, for L infinity. So nothing here, I mean, so some of them are not integrals, but all this works even when P is infinity and Q is one. But the thing is, L infinity dual is actually, so this second part is not true. These are, but only when, not when P equal to infinity. When p equal to infinity, there are many other uh, continuous linear functionals. In fact, the dual of L infinity contains L1, but it is much larger. So what we have shown is dual of LP contains LQ for all Q, that is for all P, that is true. But it's actually equal is the statement for 1 less than equal to P less than infinity. When P is infinity, it is larger, which in general, in general, in finite dimensional cases, it is actually equal. But in general, it is not equal. So if you take Rn with the L, L1 norm, uh, L infinity norm, its dual is the L1 norm, okay? So, but it is not true in infinite dimensional settings. Okay, let me tell you another uh, theorem of Ries like this, identifying the dual of a vector space, okay? So what is that? I mean, so here is another Banach space. Do you know any other Banach space? Anyone? Any Banach space other than these LP spaces? Okay, is anybody listening actually? Yes, the CX. Ah, so any any Banach space? Uh, CX. Uh, huh? Continuous functions over compact space. Ah, continuous functions over compact space. Uh, right. Oops. So let's take. So take. X is a compact Hausdorff space. So you just take x equal to 0, 1 for simplicity, okay? Example, this example is good enough. Then C of x is the space of continuous functions 
from x to real numbers. Okay. What is its dual? Okay. So that's the question. So, for example, C zero one. So this is a Banach space. So it's a Banach space. So the norm on that. Okay, for some reason, the handwriting is going bad, which is same as maximum if you want, because it's a compact one, the maximum will be attained. Okay, so this is the norm, and this is a Banach space. So C0 1 is a Banach space. What is its dual? Again, it's a theorem of Ries. that so can you give me some linear functionals on uh, cx evaluation at some point x evaluation not. at some point yes if x not huh? sorry fx not yeah sorry, sorry, not. i did not hear the voice is very low for some reason, or maybe I uh, say say again. The evaluation at some point in x. Evaluation at a point, definitely that is possible. And uh, any other? Integration, uh, integration, huh? Integration, integration with respect to a measure. So, c of x star is in fact that. So, what I would like to say is that okay. So, all those evaluation. So you remember evaluation f of half, for example, is just integral. Okay, why is the f d delta half, right? It is the integral of f with respect to the Dirac measure at half. So evaluations are also integrals with respect to measures. So it would be, I let me write as something that is wrong and then The space of all finite Boyle measures on X. And how does it act? Well, what happens there? Okay, is the nib maybe? Well, mu. Acts by sending f to integral f d mu. Yeah, so that is linear, right? f1 plus f2 will go to integral f1 d mu plus integral f2 d mu. 2f will go to 2 times the integral. But there is something wrong about this. This is not true. What is problematic here? So is somebody speaking? There is a little bit of noise. I could not hear anything. So, but this can't be true. This is there is something problematic about this. What is it? Can you give me a linear functional which is not like this? All these are linear functionals and one can also show they are continuous. Uh, let's come to that, but why these are not all. Can you give me one example which is not here? So, here is one that is not here. If I want to take f going to minus f of half, how do I get it with respect to as, how can I write it as integral f d mu? Is it possible? So negative f of half, that is a linear functional, right? Instead of evaluating, I am evaluating and negating. How can I get it as a measure? 
or if you want, you take minus f of plus f of one. So, what measure should I integrate with respect to to get that? The problem is this is not a vector space at all. Measures are nice; you can add measures, but you can't subtract measures, right? First, measures take positive values. That is the problem. So, we have to take a vector space. So, what is true here is. So finite. So let me add an extra thing called signed Boyle measures. Okay. So signed Boyle measures. What are they? Well, the signed Boyle measures are actually. What does it mean? Signed Boyle measures are basically they are of the form. Mu equal to mu one minus mu two, where mu one and mu two are measures. So there is a positive part and a negative part, and uh, such that there exists an A contained in X such that. Mu one of a is zero and mu two of a complement is zero. So that is a, you may wonder why I need that. But the thing is, you can write mu any element here is written as a difference of two measures. Now that can be done in many ways because I can add one mu one plus I can add a Lebesgue measure to it and add a Lebesgue measure to it. Mu one plus lambda minus of mu two plus lambda is same as mu one minus mu two. If I want to get a unique representation. There is an extra condition I should add, which is that you can they are supported on different sets. That is, you have a set A such that mu one lives completely here, and mu two lives completely here. Mu one puts zero mass here, mu two puts zero mass here. Mu one and mu two are ordinary positive measures in our sense. So these are called signed Boyle measures. Now it is clear what this means. This is by definition the integral with respect to a signed measure is nothing but. Integral f d mu one minus integral f d mu two. Okay, that's how it is defined. So these are the, this is what is the space of uh, this is the dual. Okay, and what is the norm? I am not trying to tell now. So there, so maybe I will not bother to tell the norm. The norm here is that is called the total variation of mu. Okay, actually, okay, I can even tell you the norm. So the norm of mu. Will be mu one of x plus mu two of x. It will be the total mass of mu one and mu two, not the difference. It is the total mass of mu one and mu two. So that will be the norm. So this is the this is another uh, example of a Banach space whose dual space can be explicitly identified uh, with measures. Okay. But you have to to make it a vector space. You have to take linear combinations of measures. So then you also have to allow negative measures. So that's why signed ball measures become important. So now there is not enough time, and so I am not going to spend any time on signed measures. In many books, you will see a chapter on signed measures and so on. Uh, there is not much subtlety to it actually. All signed ball measures are just difference of measures. But um, there are a couple of things you have to say about them to fully understand that point. Okay. Any questions about this? Uh, Sir, I don't Sir, understand, I don't the, understand last. the last. The, the, the one one fixed or. Uh, yeah, yeah. For, so okay, so I mean I'm using the symbol mu here. So this C of x star is the space of all finite sine Boyle measures. What do I mean by that? An element of it is a mu, which is of the form mu one minus mu two, where mu one mu two are two finite measures with this extra property. Then this representation is in fact unique. There is you can't write it in two ways as mu one minus mu two, plus having this property. Okay, so that is a fact. I'm just saying it. I'm asserting it. Once you do that, then mu has this information. Basically, in other words, the you can divide your space X into two pieces. Mu is a positive measure on one, and the negative of a positive measure on the other. That's what it is. 
So then, for such a lin, then it's how the how is that a linear function? It acts by integration. By which I mean this. And what is the norm of such a dual norm of such a mu? That is the norm of this linear functional. It will be mu one of x plus mu two of x. That's what I'm saying. Is is it clear now or not? Okay, okay. Sir. I'm not sure if I answered your question. I may have misunderstood what you asked. No, no, no. That is fine. That's fine. Okay. I do understand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, any uh, other questions? Uh, so this way you will see time and again identifying the dual of a uh, space is an important problem. Let me ask you one question. So this problem they look a bit similar to this looks a bit similar to the other is representation theorem I said right. There we said the other is representation theorem. Okay, so some reason it's not writing properly. So the other is representation theorem. We took the space C of x. Let's take a compact space. Okay, let's take a compact compact space. Let's take x to be compact so that this is C of x. Then all positive linear functionals are given by this. Okay, so here the condition extra condition apart from linear is positive. Whereas here it was always when we take dual, it was always some sort of continuity, right? Continuous linear functionals. So now. How did we get such a theorem without any continuity assumption? I mean, there was no continuity assumption. It seems like there was only a positivity assumption. But still, we got a representation that all such things are. The reason I did this theorem is that here you don't need to bring in any other language. You just can do it. But anyway, my question is, why is there no continuity hypothesis in this problem, whereas there is continuity hypothesis in these ones? All linear functionals have to be continuous. Why is that? Maybe I will leave you to think about it's it. It's five o'clock. I leave you to think about it. So it's five o'clock now. Maybe I can stop. I'll stop here. Actually, my charge is almost over. I may get disconnected any time also. But if there are any questions, please ask now. Uh, sir, ah. just a minor query. Have we fixed a time for the like, final exam? Oh, final exam. Yeah, I as I said, uh, so I did uh, forward you the the exam schedule as I got it that day. I don't know right, if right. they modified one uh, later. Probably not. So the, according to that, it is the very last day, which I forget the date. But uh, it was the eleventh. Huh? Eleventh. Yeah. So as I said, I am. Doing it on that day would be cleanest, and we can do it that way. But if everyone uh, who's editing has a consensus and wishes to do it on a different day, I'm okay with that. I will need a consent. No, no, I'm not talking about the day. More about the time, sir. Oh, time, time. I see. I see. Okay. Well, again, I'm open to the suggestion. So we can have morning or afternoon. Uh, the calendar, I think, suggests afternoon. Right, but if uh, people here are not having exam in the morning, then again, and to prefer yeah. to do it in the morning, that is also fine with me. All right then. Yeah, uh, maybe. Let's ask people. Yeah, so maybe it is. Uh, there is little bit of time. Maybe we'll uh, take a poll or ask if uh, uh, ask on the teams uh, whether anybody wishes to. I mean, I don't know. If afternoon is okay. We can just have it afternoon. I am okay with that. Mm -hmm. I have no problem. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh,